Today's video is going to be about covalent bonding. No Zero to Hero series would be complete without it, plus I think my students need it for their exam relatively soon. So it's not that complicated. If you have your, um, if you have your electron configurations uh, down pat, this is just a small extension upon that. So I'm going to break it up into two bits here. It's got co, and it's also made of the word valent. So that means together, and valence referring to valence electrons. So sharing their valence electrons, that's what makes the bond. Covalent bonds are shared electrons. And the what, what happens here, so if I draw a very simple example, so I'm going to draw um, hydrogen chloride, and we're going to draw it. Um, when you do this process, you uh, will develop uh, some understanding of its shape. I'm going to show you the basic way of doing it. If you want to learn the more advanced way, such as using dot diagrams rather than these sort of shell diagrams, then you can go check out the other video. I believe it's called Electron Dot Diagrams or Lewis Dot Diagrams. It should be available on my YouTube channel. But I'm going to show you a bit more of the high school level, uh, sorry, the, the, the junior science level where we use shell diagrams to draw these. So for HCl, obviously I've got a hydrogen atom and a chloride um, and a chlorine atom here. And uh, hydrogen only has one electron and it's only got one electron shell. Uh, chlorine, it's a little bit bigger. It is group 17. So it's got seven electrons in its outermost shell. And I'm just applying the knowledge that I already know. So this is group one. So I'll just say group one, therefore one valence electron, whereas chlorine is group 17, and we're just taking this digit here, the 7. We ignore that 10, as per my earlier videos have mentioned, so that means it has got 7 valence electrons in its outside shell. Notice how the way I've been encouraging you to draw these shell diagrams, these electron configurations, Notice how, how I've encouraged you to put these up in pairs. And I said to you that if you do it this way, things will pay off in the long run. Today is the day where you start to see this pay off. When I've got, when I've got them in this paired uh, state, I can easily identify where there is room for a missing electron to be, to be placed. So chlorine here it just needs one more. So I've used a blue arrow to indicate where it, should, where it would go. And for hydrogen, uh, roughly anywhere on this on this ring would be fine. But hydrogen also needs one more to make its first shell complete. So what these two atoms can do together is that they can move close enough to each other such that their electron shells become to overlap. And when they've overlapped, they now have shared access to their lone electrons. And once they shared, so if chlorine shares its lone electron to hydrogen, and hydrogen shares its lone electron to chlorine, then they form a covalent bond and they have access to the electrons that they need. So I'll then take this diagram below to the next logical step, which is when they have their shells overlapping. So hydrogen and chlorine, and I'll draw chlorine's rings first because it's a bit larger. So there's chlorine, and again it's got its lone, uh, its unpaired electron facing towards the hydrogen. I've done that deliberately so that, so that I can draw them overlapping nicely in the area that makes sense. And here I'll draw hydrogen's uh, electron shell, and I'm also going to draw hydrogen's electron. So now we can do a bit of a count to check that if things are fine. So hydrogen only has one electron shell. How many does the first shell hold? It holds two at maximum. Has hydrogen reached the maximum that it needs? Yes, it has, two electrons. Chlorine, it's a bit bigger. Its second shell can hold a maximum of eight to be happy. Has it got access to eight now? Yes, it does. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So chlorine is also happy. And that little check there proves to me that I've drawn my diagram correctly. This bit here, where I've, uh, sorry, let me circle around that. This is the covalent bond, the overlap. And we um, symbolize this uh, further, we can simplify, by representing that as a stick. And this represents that bond. Each stick represents a pair of electrons that have come together and shared. 
So if you see if there's more than one of these, that represents more covalent bonds, more pairs of electrons that are being shared amongst the two of them. I'm going to do one more, which is going to be, I'll do the water molecule, um, where you start to get, see some different shapes uh, emerging. So water is made out of this material here, H2O. That means there's got to be two hydrogens for every one oxygen. So if I just draw them in isolation, now the textbook that we use at our school seems to draw these ones in isolation first, and I think they do that deliberately so you can get an appreciation of, of how uh, these things are going to come together. So can you see here on the video, I'll leave the red marker out, can you see in the video here that hydrogen wants one more, this hydrogen here wants one more, oxygen here wants one more in that spot there, and one more there. So I could just take this hydrogen here, push it up such that it overlaps with the uh, outside shell of oxygen, and I take this one here and move it down below and get it to overlap with that part of oxygen's uh, outside shell. And once those two have overlapped, I've now formed covalent bonds. So I'll draw them again, but now, uh, but now drawn together. So oxygen, two shells, okay, and now I can draw my hydrogen atoms nearby, and each hydrogen atom only has one electron shell and one electron to donate, or oh, sorry, not to, to share, I mean, and now we can take it to the next logical step, which is to form it into a, a structure diagram or a stick diagram, where we can see a pair of electrons between these two atoms and a pair of electrons being shared between these two atoms. That's going to take our diagram into this shape. And this helps lead on, leads us on to the shapes of molecules. Can you see how this one here has a bent shape, whereas this one here is very much a linear, sort of a straight line type of diagram. The, all sorts of shapes will come about when you do electron configurations, uh, uh, sorry, when you do covalent um, bonding structures. So I'm going to do one more. It's going to be a bit more complicated than the previous two. This one is the carbon dioxide molecule. Um, so carbon dioxide has this chemical formula, one carbon, and two oxygen atoms to make a molecule. So I'm going to start, perhaps what I didn't uh, elaborate earlier when I did the uh, water example, is that the strategy is that you should probably start off with the uh, atom that has the most unpaired electrons. So oxygen here in my original diagram, it had two unpaired electrons. That makes it an ideal case to be the central atom, to attach everything else towards it. So when I look at this uh, I know that carbon here, group 14, it's going to have four valence electrons in its outside shell, um, each of them being unpaired. Oxygen has six electrons in its outside shell, but only two of them are going to be unpaired. So in this sense, carbon is going to be the central atom, and that's part of the reason why there's such a wide variety of molecules and compounds based upon carbon because it has so many different uh, so many different locations on its surface that can attach to other non-metals and make these really elaborate structures so we have a whole um, uh, a whole um, uh, category of chemistry dedicated to molecules and, and things based upon carbon we call them organic compounds where they have a carbon or a carbon backbone Carbon dioxide doesn't really have this backbone structure that I'm referring to, but um, so this one here is a bit more of the exception. We generally don't consider this one to be an organic compound. But let's do carbon as a center. So carbon, I know it's got two shells, and its outermost shell has four electrons. And like I said before, four electrons, each one of them is being unpaired. That means it can attach one more electron on all sides. That's what I was referring to before. It's a really good atom to join things towards. Now I look at the oxygen, uh, oxygen atoms and we'll again take that strategy from the textbook where they draw these oxygen atoms in isolation and see how they might fit together with, uh, with the carbon atom. So I'm drawing my electrons in a bit haphazard manner. You really should follow the rule that I have mentioned to you guys before in the electron configurations video. Once you have absolutely nailed that process, you get a feel for how um, for 
what they should look like at the end. So you might sort of do a haphazard method like I just did now because I know what the end product should look like. Okay, so I can see that for this oxygen atom here, it's got two uh, electrons that can be shared. Um, if, I if I take this one and turn it around, if I take this and I turn it around and push it up to here, I could get those two to match up with those two electrons and make two bonds, two pairs of electrons being shared this orientation. And if I take this oxygen atom and just push it along that way, I can get it to join up with those two unpaired electrons and they can then make two bonds there. So I'll do that. So I'll take the carbon atom one more time. And I'll take the oxygen atom here, which I did, said I'll take it and put it this way, such that these two unpaired electrons are facing the right orientation to join up. And I've drawn this electron shell overlapping with that second shell of carbon. I've probably done it a bit too far. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, oh, I've messed it up a little bit, but there. I should have put that one there. And I would take this one here and push it against these, these unpaired electrons over here. So I'll try and draw it more carefully this time. And there I am. So now if we look at the diagram more closely, this is a pair of electrons being shared among, between the two. And these are another pair of electrons being shared amongst the two. This is the reason why carbon dioxide has this structure, where it's got double bonds between the oxygen and the carbon atoms. I've also got another pair being shared here, another pair being shared here. This is what we do in um, basic drawings of molecules. Um, for my students doing their practice uh, for their exam, please go to the chapter in the textbook about uh, when it's, I think it's something about sharing electrons in chapter four, and uh, there are some practice problems in there. I will list these compounds in the comments below or the little de uh, description of box below this video so that the, uh, those of you online, you can just follow along and practice doing your own diagrams. And with that, that's pretty much uh, how covalent, um, com covalent bonding works. It's sharing electrons. Some properties of covalent compounds that I haven't addressed. I know this is going to be a long video, I apologize. Uh, but some properties of covalent compounds. They tend to form molecules. And what that means is that They don't go on and on and on and on forever like the ionic compounds do, where they stack together in these grids. Um, when they behave like molecules, they are little bundles, they're little discrete uh, packages. And so you can imagine that these are separate from each other, okay, these molecules. In some cases, we have a special branch of chemistry where they form long chains. Those are called polymers, but we're not going to talk about that. But for most things, you'll see they tend to form molecules. And they've got incredibly strong bonds between the atom and its shared electron neighbor. Okay, so this shared electrons being, these shared electrons forming this bond is very strong. However, there is very little attraction force between this and this and their neighboring molecules. So it tends to be very, very weakly bond, uh, attracted to each other. Uh, and, and, and the other neighboring molecules. Now, it depends on the type of molecule. Water happens to be very strongly attracted to other water molecules. Carbon dioxide is very weakly attracted to other carbon dioxide molecules. And there's a whole branch of chemistry as to why that occurs, which we're not going to go into today. But because they tend to have relatively weak attraction between molecules compared to the strength of the bond inside of the molecules, they tend to have different sets of properties. So they tend to be in molecule form and they also tend to have relatively low boiling points. And what that means is that at a given temperature, they tend to be more like liquids or even gases at room temperature. 
compared to ionic compounds, which will almost always, I think always, um, will always be at solid at room temperature because their bonds between them are so strong, they hold them together in a solid state. Here, they have very little attraction relative to the strength of the covalent bonds, so they tend to be more like um, liquids or gases. So we got low melting or boiling points. They also tend to be relatively soft. So again, this comes to the nature of the molecules having very weak attraction between each other. Um, so if this was in a, in a network here, it would be relatively easy to push them around. So they will be relatively soft. Uh, and there is a different degree of solubility, so we tend to divide it into two camps. You either are a polar molecule, where things dissolve really well in water, or you're a non-polar molecule, which you will dissolve really well in non-polar things like uh, alcohols and oils and such. Again, I won't go into that detail, but uh, that's just another property. So they may have solubility in water or in fats and oils and alcohols. So that's usually the two camps. I'm not going to go into any further things like that. Um, that'll be another video.